Amen. It's been a good trip. Amen. Yes. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to the book of Joshua, Joshua 18. And uh, while you're turning there, uh, as always, remember me as your pastor that I would find leadership to guide the church. That's what we need. And if uh, I'm in the will of the Lord, then the leadership will be good. And if I'm not, it'll be bad. Uh, Joshua 18, in the very first verse, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued before them, and there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. inheritance. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are ye slack that you, go, that you go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers have given you? Give out, each, give out from among you three men of each tribe, and I will send them, and they shall rise and go through the land and describe it according to the inheritance of them, and they shall come again to me. And they shall divide it into seven parts. Judah shall abide in the coast of the south, and the house of Joseph shall abide in the coast of the north. You shall therefore describe the land into seven parts and bring the description hither to me, that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord of the Lord our God. I'd like to preach the Lord being my helper this morning on a description of home. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another opportunity to be in your house and to meet with your people. Lord, another opportunity this side of eternity uh, to spread the gospel and to point to you and to rejoice in our pilgrimage as we travel here below. God, we are uh, anxious for the day that you might call us home to be with you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now here we find uh, Joshua in a situation where, and we'll get to it in a minute, really it was because of idleness and because of uh, a false peace that he had to send three more of the seven tribes across the, uh, the, the, across the land to describe it better. Now, if you remember that he'd already one time before sent 12, one from a tribe to spy out the land, and they came back with a, with a, a load of grapes, just one, uh, one handful of grapes, one piece that they carried between two men. It was so heavy. But they're uh, denied that despite the blessings they acknowledged, they said we can't take it. Now, I don't know what your situation is this morning, uh, what you're discouraged about, what you're uh, unsure about, but let me say this, God's able, whatever the situation, whatever the problem, God's able. Uh -huh. Now, all through your life and all through my life of serving the Lord, sometimes the devil gets in the way and smudges that remembrance that God is able. That, that he's on the throne and he's doing all things after only the counsel of his own will. He don't need any help. So in the first verse, it says the whole congregation, every one of them was involved. Every one had a sense of complacency and was in a, in a mode of let's stop here. And, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. Now, I want you to see, in, in just looking at it, it don't seem a bad thing. They set up their tabernacle, uh, their place of meeting together, their spiritual house, but they stood still. What happened to the church of Jerusalem? It stood still, didn't it? And it became a problem to them. And there's never a getting off spot, and there's never a standing still spot for the Lord 
God's people. And why? Because we're pilgrims and strangers in this present evil land. And so they set up the tent. And uh, then he says, and the land, the present spot was subdued before them. In other words, they owned it, they possessed it, and they were the rulers. That'd be easy to get used to, wouldn't it? They were in control. Uh, things were under their feet. And I think a lot of times we get subdued too, don't we? Uh, we get to the point, well, hey, there's nothing left to do. In verse 2, he says, And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. Now, here is the sense of complacency. Instead of being anxious, you know what? If I had something out there that I had not yet received, I would want to run to it and get it for myself. But you know what? We have something better every day if we look for it uh we've not arrived yet right we're not done with this battle and, and so if we believe the word of god and i do there's always something better out there we're pilgrims and strangers keep moving for it keep looking for it and i will guarantee you the god of the bible will show you where it's at so if you think about it numerically less than half should have been satisfied. Five tribes had their inheritance, two on the opposite side of the Jordan River, three had crossed and possessed it so far, so that left seven tribes that were satisfied that shouldn't have been. You know, we sing that, so, that song, when I'm standing in the presence of the Lord, I'll be satisfied. But you know what? The problem is this this morning. Most of us are satisfied right here. We're, we're, we're satisfied in the current situation where we ought not to be because it's not the situation that God has built for us. Verse 2. And, uh, excuse me, verse 3, And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are ye slack to possess the land? Now, I want you to see, Joshua was enough of a good pastor, despite that the, tent, the tabernacle was set up, and despite they were worshiping the Lord, he said, Hey, listen, y'all are slacking. Y'all are slacking on the job. You ever wonder why you get so miserable spiritually and you get discouraged and you get down? Well, probably you're slacking. Probably you're not doing the full job. Probably you're not praising enough. Probably you're not looking enough. Probably you're satisfied right there where you're at. And what that produces is a feeling of misery. And then you know what we want to blue, uh, blame our blues on? We want to blame it on God and say, woe is me, woe is me. And, and so we find then that they had a real issue and Joshua pointed it out for them. Send them, uh, excuse me, give out from among you three men for each tribe, verse 4, and I will send them, and they shall rise and go through the land and describe it according to the inheritance of them, and they shall come again to me. Now, what Joshua was hoping to do was inspire this bunch a little bit. And what I'm hoping to do for you this morning is inspire you a little bit. Listen, we got some good, good things coming. Don't be discouraged. Don't get on your pity horse. Listen, we have a land that's before us that's far better than this. We have things to enjoy on that side of Jordan which we have never even thought about yet. You know, old John tried to write her down the best he could. But listen, he knew then that he couldn't really get a hold of the words. And you know why I believe that he couldn't? He didn't know the language. Hey, he was caught up into the third heaven, the abode of God, and, and he didn't understand what he, saw, what he saw, but he did the best he could to describe it. So what my invitation to you is the very same one that Joshua uh, 
requested of the children of Israel, look at what's ahead. Verse 5, and they shall divide it, meaning the land, into seven parts, and Judah shall abide in their coast on the south, and the house of Joseph shall abide in their coast on the north, and ye shall therefore describe the land in seven parts. Bring the description hither to me, that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. Now, I want you to see another thing that he'd already picked out a portion for Joshua and said, I want him up here in the north. You know what? Have you ever thought about that the Lord has a position already for you? There, you know, if we believe in predestination and all of us say that we do, there has to be a spot up there for you, right? It, 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 ha it has to be specific. And one day, I will sit in that spot and praise the Lord throughout the ceaseless ages. And, and so we find, he said, hey, go look. And, and his desire was to make them anxious for it. His desire was to motivate them to the point they began to go and possess the land. And, and you know what? My desire this morning is, is to motivate you. Listen, we've got better things coming. And you know, all this corona stuff that's happened and all this uh, this crazy uh, uh, riots and stuff through our land, all of their sent to the pilgrim is to get their attention off the road. Yeah. That, that's all it's about. It, you know, everybody says, oh, it's for the election. And I said that in November. No, no. It's for us to discourage us, to make things look hopeless here in the last day. But listen, they're not hopeless. The best is yet to come. And so we as the Lord's people, sometimes we need a reminder of that so we don't feel like quitting. Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 in the very first verse. Luke chapter 4 in the very first verse. The Bible says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Very purposed plan for the ministry of Christ. Being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward uh, hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of Man, command these stones that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Thou shalt not uh, live by bread alone, but every word, every, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, shoot him onto the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now, I, I read this to show you this. It's not a new thing for lost people to damned people to focus on this world. See, the devil himself said, look, look here, you can make you some good bread, you can fill your gut, you can take care of that hunger by this little stone here. He was enticing him by the flesh. And you know what's going to get your mind off of eternal things? Things of this flesh. The desires of the flesh, the drives of the flesh, and wandering from the Word of God. Then I want you to see also that after he got through the bread, he, he showed him all the kingdoms that ever would be and that ever was in a moment of time. And he said, I'll give them to you. Again, he was enticing the flesh. Now the way you get your mind off spiritual things is to entice the flesh. Now, none of us have seen all the kingdoms of the world, and, and none of us have, have uh, been on the pinnacle of the temple in the, old, in the old Jerusalem. But see, we have seen stuff like this, trucks, cars, clothing, careers, 
Now, all that is to remove your attention from the Almighty. All of that is to remove your attention from focusing on being a good pilgrim. All those things to do is just like the read in the book of Joshua is to settle you down, to make you stop, to give you an abiding place when our abiding place is not here. We haven't seen it yet. We've not arrived yet at our final abiding place and we shouldn't get uh, we shouldn't get mucked up while we're abiding here. So we'll see that for lost people and people that are saved that are not where they ought to be, they don't get this. Nor will they ever get it. Yet, you know what looks good to this flesh? Now, back in the 70s, it was a three-bedroom brick. Now it's a five-bedroom. I went to my niece's house and I'm, I'm proud for them, but I've never seen such a house. That's a good thing, but listen, to lost people, it's the only thing. They've arrived, right? That they're where they want to be. It's not an abiding place for them, it's home. When I turn up on 201 Tobacco Port Road, in my mind, I say I'm home. No. But I'm not. No. No. Not yet. And, 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 and so we, as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that no matter what this world has to offer, and no matter how alluring it may be and appealing it may be to the flesh, we have to look on things in a spiritual nature. We have to look at this present time as much spiritually as we do for the things ahead. Now go with me uh, to the second Corinthians, Paul writing the second time to the church of Corinth, uh, second Corinthians 12, uh, in the first verse, uh, second Corinthians chapter 12, in the first verse, the Bible says this, it is not expedient, expedient for me, doubtless to glory. Now, we find the first spiritual thing you need to remember is not to glory in yourself. Right. You ever met preachers like that? I have. Uh, I mean, uh, they, uh, and, and, and some of them had a wonderful preaching ability. But they came, became prideful in it, did they not? That, that's a very cautious thing for a preacher, uh, is to become prideful about what they say and how to say it. And here we have Paul the evangelist, uh, probably beside the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest preacher that ever lived. And he was very mindful of that. He was very mindful of that. And, and, and so we find that an, an element of feeling at home where we're not at home is pride. For it is not expedient me, expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, uh, I don't really understand this verse as well as I should. Number one, I think the visions and revelations probably uh, belong to Paul. But I have seen this over the years. Because the scripture is a living word, I see things different as time rolls along. So he says, I'm going to give you some more information in a few minutes. I'm going to, I'm going to expand your knowledge a little bit uh, after we get done talking about this. Verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether the out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows. Now, a lot of people have a, little bit, a lot of different ideas on this. I personally think he's talking about John. I, I don't know that Paul was ever called up into the third heaven. Uh, I know John was, because the Bible says he was. And, and, and so I don't know if he's talking about a personal experience, or if he's talking about just meeting John along the way, and hearing of the wonderful things that John knew. But I want you to see that either way, he was very 
rejoiced. He was very happy. He was very glad to see. And, and the best I can understand, just like Peter on the housetop, uh, by the very writing of the word, he had some type of out of body experience. And when he was up there, when he was meeting this person, listen, it made him homesick. See, you know, you know why we don't get homesick enough? We don't hear about home. You think about the average Southern Grace churches. How many, how many messages have you heard about glory and, and the time to come? You, you know what? Most of the time, poor old Brother McCoy, he just couldn't get off the election, could he? <laughs> Loved him dearly. But they'll hear their five points. And they're done. Nothing wrong with that. But you know what? I want to hear about home sometime. I want to hear about when this mass is ended and I'm in glory with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want, to, I want to hear something that makes me hungry for tomorrow. And that's exactly what Paul exper um, experienced here is that he got this little taste of glory and it made him hungry for more. He was not satisfied. Verse 3, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard, and heard unspeakable words that is not lawful for a man to utter. So we find that this individual was caught up into the third heaven, the very abode of God, and he saw things he couldn't relate. You know what? You get in a time of prayer and you get your nose in that book and you'll see some things that you haven't seen before. You'll get so excited about glory that that's all you think about is going home to be with Jesus. And that's exactly this experience that Paul... And, and the, the only thing I can figure, he wanted the church of Corinth to know so that they get a little bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted them to be just as hungry for the third heaven as he was. Just as excited about the time ending here and going home to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted them to be excited what was about uh, that was before them, not the misery that they lived in now. Verse 5. Of such a one meaning of the one that he saw in the third heaven, of the things that he saw up there, of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. And so that's why I don't think that Paul was caught up, because he says one that can give me a picture of that, if it was John or whomever, he says, man, that's glorified. That's exciting. That's time when I'm going to get to go home. And, and I'm excited and glad about that. And you know what? We just don't hear preaching about exciting things anymore, do we? We don't hear uh, about, uh, come up here. We don't hear about, hey, some of us will not taste death. We don't hear about the fact that there's a real third heaven. And by the grace of God, one day we'll be there. We just don't hear it. And then because we don't hear it, I have to believe that the saints get discouraged. They, they get down and they get to the point, listen, they want to quit. They want to give up. They want to throw in the towel and say, you know what? Forget it. I'm not doing anymore. And that is the reason today we have church door after church door being closed. Uh, you know, when we went to New Mexico, I was searching the internet, hopefully finding a suitable church for me and Donna and the girls on Wednesday night. And I, I found one right there in, in, in the city where we were at. And then as I was scrolling down the page, closed for lack of support. You know what? I believe and I hope that I would have uh, started meeting in the house. Done something, because listen, but you know what happened to that church? It wasn't financial. I believe the Lord will provide our needs. He always has. The problem is they lost the vision. The problem is they quit thinking about home. Yeah. And they got that this is all there is. Misery, meeting by ourselves, woe is me. 
and they quit thinking about home. Yeah. And, and so we find that we see that more and more as the as the years fly by, we see more and more churches that are that are no longer in existence. And the reason why they forget about home. Now, Revelation, practically the whole book was a vision because somebody got right with the Lord and started thinking about home. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. <laughs> First little phrase always sets me on fire. <laughs> I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Yeah. You know what? The only thing I can figure, if old John got in the spirit, he'd spent some days out of the spirit. <laughs> And man, you know what I have? I, I, I spent some days where uh, I feel like quitting, where I felt like throwing in the town, more people leaving than coming. And you know what? All that is is the flesh. You know what? If the Lord Jesus Christ preached three and a half years and came out 12, I guess we're doing pretty good. Amen. I guess we are. Yeah. And uh, so... Uh, <laughs> Problem then probably isn't numbers, is that you lack the spirit. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Man, that ain't Pentecostal, is it? That's the position of a believer that's right with God. Yeah. And, and so we find that uh, John says very boldly and very, uh, very uh, quickly, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And you know what? The Lord's day, despite what's happening, listen, there's more, there's more people now about that the seventh day is there is on the Lord's day, but the seventh day was for God, Jehovah the Father, and Sunday is for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and we need to keep that up. That's right. Don't ever let anybody dupe you into that because, listen, they're sly-toned people. And, and so we find that John was in good shape for worship on the Lord's day. And you know what? He wasn't meeting with nobody but himself. Because when this happened, he was out on the aisle of Patmos left to die. Yeah. And he was meeting with God. And that's where we ought to want to be. I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as the sound of a trumpet. And saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. You know what? What a glorious, glorious thing. And you'll see that if your King James Bible has the reds written, the words written in a red, I'm the first and the last. You know who's going to get the last little tail in this place? The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, they're not in control. They'll, they'll dupe you in to thinking they're in control. Uh, but they're not. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you heard this, and I thought, you know what? God's still in control. That foolish Barack Obama and his Jezebel wife is going to get him a TV program. Mm -hmm. This sounds bad, and I may be in the flesh, but I hope they choke on it. Mm -hmm. But you know, despite if it's successful, and listen, there's enough rebels out there, they may get an award for it. Mm -hmm. But you know what? God is going to have... Uh, the Omega. He, he's going to have the last letter. Absolutely. He's the one that's going to finish it up, not, not that bunch. And so we find then that he identifies himself and says, hey, I've got control from the beginning and I've got control all the way to the end until we get to Z. You know, Alpha and Omega is the it, it symbols in the Greek alphabet, but in the English alphabet, what he's saying is I'm A to Z. I'm everything. I'm from the very beginning to the very and you know what? Jared, that should be somebody we can worship. Yeah. That should be somebody we should get excited about. It's listen, the one that has it all bound up in one little thing. Uh, you think about it, one little ball of all creation and everything that's going to happen to the end, and him just bouncing it because it belongs to him. And so we find then, when you <laughs> see the Lord, well, who he is. I, John, verse 9, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 11, saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what seest thou, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, 
unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Now, I want you to see these were specific messages. You know, uh, I believe the Lord has a specific message for every church, don't you? Yeah. Uh, that's one of my big issues with the Southern Baptist Association and their little literature. And they all send it out, and they're all supposed to be reading the same thing on the same Sunday. <laughs> I think it's garbage. Because you know what? If I go into the nursing home and give everybody the same medicine tomorrow, <laughs> yeah. it's going to be good for some. Some of them it won't affect a bit, and there's others that it'll kill. <laughs> So he says, I've got an individual message for each of you. Isn't it a wonderful thing this morning as we're on our way home that the Lord God of Almighty Heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, has a specific message for New Testament Baptist Church. Verse, uh, the verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake unto me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Oh, what a, what a wonderful thing. And I believe it was one candlestick per church. Don't think it had anything to do, do with Israel because then I think there'd been 12. But one candlestick per church. <laughs> he slipped around and, and, and turned around and he saw the reality of the Lord God of heaven. He saw the reality of, of his relationship with his own churches. And, and, and he rejoiced in that. You know what? Uh, we ought to rejoice this morning that, that he has a specific relationship with New Testament Baptist Church. And all other his churches that are about, he has, he has a specific thing for them. Verse 13. And, uh, and in the midst of the seven gold, golden in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like, like unto the son of God clothed with a garment down to his foot and girt about with his paps and with a golden girdle so we find the Lord Jesus Christ in that in, in who he was and, and what he was doing verse 15 and his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice was as the sound of many waters and he, and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun and shineth in his strength and so these seven churches were fixing to get a message specifically to them and he was spitting out with a two-edged sword and as a uh, as the old preacher says, that's one that cut going and coming. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? Of all those churches, except for Philadelphia, man, he took hot hair and all, didn't he? He says, I know that wicked woman, Jezebel, who called her a prophet, who calls herself a prophetess and is not. He said, Hey, I know where Satan's seat is. It isn't a wonderful thing that all this is under his dominion and under his control, and, and we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to stress about it. We don't have to uh, get the boo-hoos about it. All we have to do is enjoy a sovereign God and him being on the throne. Now, Revelation chapter 4, in the very first verse, Revelation Chapter 4, he says, and After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened into heaven. Now, I don't know if we'll ever see a door open into heaven. I don't see any Bible for that. But listen, you get in that book, and he opens something to you, run through the door. You, you know how you're going to get encouraged in that book in your life this morning? Listen, people are not going to encourage you. I've had, I've had saved people that were, that were almost a misery to me. But you know what? Where I can always get help is that book in your life this morning. Because you know what? That's the very words of life. Uh, and, and, and when the door opens, 
offerings. I'm going to run through it. I'm going to see what's on the other side. I'm going to see what he has for me this morning as I delve into his word and the door flies open. Listen, uh, you, you know what? Today, people are scared to go through that door. If it ain't about the five points and about the bride of Christ, listen, they don't want to hear it. But you know what? That Bible has a whole lot more to say. It has a lot to say about living and has a lot to say about the life that's to come. Mm -hmm. and, and so we ought to always, as the Lord's people, if the door opens, hey, run through it. Go to it and, and see what God has just for you. And uh, behold, a throne was set in heaven and one that and and one that sat on the throne, and he that sat there was to look upon like a jasper stone, a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow about the throne, and the sight unto in, in, in sight like unto an emerald. Now, if you read the rest of chapter one uh, this week, you will find that he saw the same thing there. Right before the church letter started, it says that there was one like with a rainbow. You, you know what makes me most sick? A lot of things that makes me sick, but what makes me so sick of the sodomite movement, movement is them taking God's rainbow of peace and making it their symbol. Yeah. You, you think that's not deliberate? Listen, that, that, they knew that, and they set it up because they're God haters from the inside out. But you know what? Despite what they do, that's our symbol of what? Peace. Uh, I'll never destroy the world again by flood. Right. Now, he's going to destroy her. He's going to wipe her out. But it ain't going to be by flood the next time around. And, and, and so we find that the man that holds the promise and the man that holds the key to peace was right there among them. And listen, it made, it made John excited. Verse 4, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded, proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of the fire burning before the throne, which are the Spirit of God. And he goes on to say, I'm going to end up toward 10 or 11 in there, and it fell out before him, worshiped, cast their crowns before him. Listen, that ought to be exciting news. That ought to be great, exciting things. And you know what? You preach it today, and people don't care. They're not interested in the end times, they're not interested in the power of praise. You know what? Why do we let the Pentecostals take from us praising God in the right way? Bible says, I would that the men lift holy hands everywhere. Yeah. How long has it been since you've seen that one? <laughs> yeah. You just don't see it, do you? I mean, let's be honest. We just don't see it. Yeah. And, and, and so we find then that John was excited and he was glad that he had this experience. And, and man, I, I'm looking forward to the time. And this, I want to remind you, this was on his journey. It wasn't at the end. Now, what he was receiving was end-time prophecy, right? But hey, John was still on his journey. He was out there on the Isle of Patmos. And it's the same John. He lived to be 110 years old. He, he still had a long time before it. But he, but he had this experience on the Isle of Patmos. You know what? I want my prayer life to be in such a condition that I have experiences like that. Because you know what? If I don't, I feel like quitting. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and, and so we find then that, uh, listen, John didn't have the boo-boos. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And the Spirit opened wonderful things up to him. And praise God, he's able to share them with us today. Revelation 17. Revelation 17, <coughs> verse 14. Revelation 17, verse 14. The Bible says these, this, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that 
which and they which are were which and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now, you get all three of those elements. First of all, you're called. That's an effectual call. That's not me begging somebody to come up here and say a little prayer. That's an effectual call like Lydia had. And chosen, you know what? That was eternity past. And when I began to think about that, I can't even get my feeble mind around it. But I do know that it's true. Now, this is the one that, that, that gets people. Call, uh, <laughs> called, chosen, and faithful. You know what? I believe God's people will be faithful. And I don't have to beg them to church. I don't have to give them a ride. They'll be here. And you know what? If that's the faithful, then the only thing I can come to is that the unfaithful are quitters. Yeah. The unfaithful are people that you couldn't even get in here with a crane if you had one. Those are the unfaithful. And you know what? By the word of God, I can see right here that the only people that will see victory are the, are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. You know what? I want to see victory. I've not seen enough of it in my personal ministry. I want to see victory. And listen, victory ain't just people saved. Victory is a way you live. Victory is a, is a mindset of the heart. Victory is picking up the, the vic, little victories along the way. You saying, hey, listen, guess what God did for me? And tell that, the Bible says this, tell it to your children and tell it to your grandchildren, to the third and fourth generation. Keep telling them. And, and, and so we see, we see then as the Lord's people that, uh, that uh, if you're not excited, maybe it's your faithfulness. Maybe it's your calling. Listen, don't, don't be timid to make your calling and election sure. And be bold in the things of God. Revelation 19. Revelation 19. This verse 16. Revelation 19, 16. And he had on his vesture and on his, thing, and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Man, I want to see that, don't you? I don't understand about the sash, and the, but I know it's going to say King of kings and Lord of lords right down the side. And listen, by the word of God, I'm going to see it. I, I, I'm excited about the day. Uh, you know, have you ever wondered if it's printed on there or if it's embroidered on there or if it's in gold and what that what that vesture might look like and be? And the, you know, what a what glorious sight. But you know what? We'll be able to identify him by King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Listen, if you believe that this morning, what could else could go wrong? Everything. Everybody under his feet. Yeah. Listen, when he walked across the water to get his apostles, listen, that water wasn't the only thing under his feet. Everything is under his feet. All problems all races, all tribes, all tongues, and right under his feet. And I don't know about you, but that makes me excited that I can serve a God that, listen, everything, everything is under his feet. Now, I'm going to read one more place, and I promise we're done. Revelation 22. And, uh, Revelation 22 and, and verse 18. For I testify unto you, every man that heareth the words of this, the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Now, that's some, that's some pretty, pretty graphic warnings, ain't it? You know what I think the Book of Mormon is? I think it's trash. You know what I, I think that 
uh, Bible that if you falsely so called that Charles Taz Russell wrote, I think it's trash. You know what I think the New King James Version is? I think it's trash. We, we should have no part of it. And, and so we see that we're to reverence this, this book before us and we get this time close into the Lord. Listen, it's going to come out of this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of the prophecy, and you think about this, and how many people take away from that book? How many sovereign grace Baptists do you know that lift holy hands? You know what they've done, Jared? They've took it away from the book. How many people do you know that will get up and say, hey, I was moved by the Spirit this morning? They call you everything they could think of and put with me. But yet still the Bible says that he show us some things. He that testifies these things saith, surely I come quickly. I'm going to leave you with that this, this morning. The Lord's coming quickly. I was thinking about Brother John. He used to have those big singings over there at the farm. And way back then, in the early 80s, Brother John was saying he's coming quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's been 40 years ago now. And you know what? I'm going to say the same thing that Brother John did. He's coming quickly. Uh, be ready. If you're not saved, make your call in the election sure. For those that are saved, be excited. Don't be groomy. Uh, you know what, God's in control of this morning. Right. You know what, all that happened with Brother John is he finished his course. Right. He's, he was done. Right. And the Lord took him on by the grace of God. Right. We need to be like that, right. excited until the end. Right. And if you're excited, you won't have no trouble with obedience. But if you're down and out and got the mother drubbies, Listen, anything God asks you will seem to be.